Hello, my name is Kim Eagle from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm very delighted to be with you today covering the first day of the ACC 24 National Scientific Sessions in Atlanta, Georgia. We're covering some of the very important trials at this meeting today. I'm joined by uh, several notable colleagues who are experts in clinical trials. Payel Coley from Denver, Colorado, uh, Darren Kambani from Dallas, Texas, and Ajay Kirtani from New York City. There are um, so many trials to cover, but we're going to pick three to talk to you this morning about. Um, and I want to start with Aegis 2. Ajay, tell us about this study. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. This was an ambitious trial. Um, 18,000 patients aimed at looking at a new hypothesis, basically a hypothesis that you could improve cholesterol efflux. Remember, HDL, not just in terms of its number, but in terms of its function, can bring cholesterol away from the arterial wall. And the reason I think it's ambitious is most lipid-lowering therapies have looked at um, agents and their effects over a long period of time. These were patients who came in with myocardial infarction, about a half STEMI, half non-STEMI, and treated with four weekly infusions of this agent, uh, APOA1, and looking at 90 days to see if there could be a reduction in cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. That's ambitious, and unfortunately, the trial did not meet its primary endpoint in terms of showing a reduction. However, although if you looked over time, particularly through the follow-up period to a year, there were some trends that seemed to emerge perhaps in favor of this drug and the hypothesis that improving HDL function could reduce clinical outcomes. Look, the trial is negative in terms of its primary endpoint. There will be sticklers out there who just interpret the data that way. Very interesting subgroup of patients that had elevated LDLs at baseline did have a statistically significant reduction in the primary endpoint. So in my mind, this hypothesis is not dead. I think it's certainly worth investigating. And I do commend the investigators for doing this type of trial to look at after the point of care of an MI, could you induce a drug to improve um, cholesterol away from the, the wall and then change clinical endpoints? So I think there'll be more to come from this study. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, I agree. 18,000 new patients enrolled, it's massive. One would think that perhaps if there was longer follow-up, perhaps there would have been effect with the effects on plaques and, and vulnerability later, but uh, time will tell. There's another study being released today that I think has a wonderful name. It's called Victorian. Uh, Pyle, tell us about this trial. And thanks, Kim. And the Victorian trial actually builds upon the Orion trials, which looked in, at inclycerin, which is an siRNA that targets PCSK9. So remember, siRNAs are small interfering RNAs. They work upstream of the protein. They work from the messenger RNA to the protein. So what I really love about this trial is that it really changed the way that we think about lipid treatment, because so much of what we're doing in lipids, we know what we're supposed to do, right? Get that LDL down, get it down quickly and get it down for longer. And yet for all these complex reasons, clinical inertia, access to care, we're unable to do it. So in this phase 3B trial, what they did was use upfront in glycerin as a treatment for patients who had LDLs greater than 70 milligrams per deciliter as the threshold or non-HDLs greater than 100, and then followed them out to 330 days to see whether or not you got that LDL down, and also looked at, interestingly, statin discontinuation. Now, this was an open-label trial, so you knew if you were getting glycerin or you were getting usual standard of care. But what they saw, not surprisingly, if you got in glycerin up front, and that's a, you know, twice a year after you get those first two doses at zero months and three months, you go every six months, you got your LDL down more. So more people got below 55 and more people got below 70. But the part that was really surprising to me was that despite the fact that in the usual standard of care, their LDLs were not coming down, these patients had ASDVD, there was not intensification of statin therapy really sort of highlighting the problem. In fact, there was a pretty high rate, about a 17% rate of statin discontinuation. So to me, this trial has really changed how I'm thinking about lipid lowering in my patients. Combination therapy upfront aggressively can get them there faster, but a few words of caution. As we know, inclycerin obviously has good early outcome or early data, but the outcomes data is not yet out. So certainly something to think about. And then the expert consensus decision pathway does suggest uh, preferential use of the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies because they have longer safety and efficacy data. But I'm hoping that this trial is a wake-up call that we got to do better with statin and also helps us to really think about that early aggressive, hit those plaques hard, hit the LDL hard, try to get it down early. Great. Love your coverage of that. 
you know, we, we sort of are paralyzed by the way the new drugs get introduced, aren't we? We, we know this one works and we add this or that. And these investigators said, wait, let's, let's look at this completely differently. Let's get that LDL down right away with an agent that we know works and seems to have benefit. Uh, and I love the thinking in this trial and there's a lot more to, to be learned for sure. There's a trial being uh, released today also that I liked a lot. It's called Relief HF. Darren, tell us about that study. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, and, you know, uh, this was a very exciting trial. So as, you know, we know in patients with heart failure, both in patients with reduced ejection fraction, as well as in those with preserved ejection fraction, the LA pressures tend to increase with exercise. And so that is one of the drivers for these patients having exertional symptoms. So there's been a lot of interest in um, uh, investigating the role of interatrial shunt devices, uh, particularly among patients with FPEF. And we've seen, you know, a couple of trials already, and there are several others that are ongoing. So this is, uh, a, a, again, a device trial using the V-Wave device um, in patients uh, with both HEFPEF as well as FREF. And so this was, you know, a pretty big undertaking. Uh, they included 500 patients across uh, multiple sites. And they are stratified by ejection fraction. So they included patients with both FREF, defined as an EF of less than or equal to 40, or patients with HEFPEF, that is patients with an ejection fraction greater than 40%. And then they were randomized to receiving this device, which is basically uh, a self-expanding platform. It has a right atrial disc and a left atrial disc, um, and uh, you know typically results in a QPQS, a shunt fraction of about 1.2 or so. And uh, you know what they uh, were looking at was both safety and efficacy. So they met their safety endpoint, uh, and there were really zero events. Um, and so that was really good to see. Uh, unfortunately, they did not meet um, the efficacy endpoint. So their primary endpoint was designed as a win ratio, which we're seeing increasingly in um, you know contemporary trials. Um, and the win ratio uh, did not show a significant benefit in favor of um, the interatrial shunt device. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned the comparison arm was actually a sham control. That is also something that has been really good to see, uh, you know, in, in uh, device trials, particularly of late. Um, and so they did not see a benefit. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, there was evidence of significant um, interaction between the two strata. So patients who had HEFREF or reduced ejection fraction appeared to benefit primarily with a reduction in um, heart failure hospitalization, whereas patients with HEFPEF um, actually showed worsening um, outcomes with um, the device implant. Um, and there was also concerningly uh, an increase in mortality in the device arm. So I think, you know, what we don't know from this trial is, is this a failure of the device or the technology? Because as I mentioned, particularly among FPF patients, there are many ongoing trials. So I think this is something we'll have to keep an eye on. I think, of course, the subgroup analyses have to be viewed in the context of an overall negative trial. Um, but I think, uh, you know, this mortality signal is particularly concerning and something we'll have to keep an eye on in ongoing trials as well. Thank you, Darren. I, I agree with your conclusions. The the differences in those two arms by EF was just absolutely striking and certainly makes one think that a separate trial looking specifically at HEFREF, uh, the, the trial may be positive in that circumstance. Also encourage our learners to take a look at step uh, HEFPEF DM, you know, we're on a roll with the GLP-1 agonists and their benefit across various strata in cardiovascular care. This looks at patients with diabetes and HEFPEF, and again, uh, striking results in these agents that seem to have primary cardiac effects, not just diabetes, not just weight loss. So the ACC, Saturday, April 6, lots of great trials. I want to thank uh, Payal, Ajay, and Darren for covering these really important late breakers today and wish our learners a great day on this first day at ACC24. This is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and I'm out.